Hello, and welcome to the lecture for chapter three on the topic of momentum and energy. At this point in the course, we are still firmly within the category of physics in our exploration of the physical sciences. And we're still covering the basics of physics, which is basically what we do in this class. Now, the topics we've talked about so far have been forces and motion, and how the two are related by Newton's laws of motion. The great thing there is it's given us the units of force, how does a force function, and then motion can be described by velocity and acceleration. But there are some other key players in physics, real building block physical quantities, and those are momentum and energy. They are so interesting because they actually have some very important ideas together. But let's take a look at what we're going to discuss. We're going to begin by talking about momentum and how it's related to something called impulse, which is just a term that means change in momentum. I'll reiterate that in just a moment. We then have impulse changing momentum, the idea of conservation of momentum, I'll come back to that word, then we'll get into energy and work in terms of definitions. Then what is power? Well, it's the rate that energy is changed. We had know that as an everyday term, we're going to officially define it here something called the work energy theorem, which is just a really useful law to help us understand the physical word, world. And then conservation of energy. Well, there's that word again, conservation. And that's what the two quantities have in common. Momentum and energy are both what are known as conserved quantities, which means that under certain conditions, very common, very fundamental conditions, momentum or energy or both are conserved. And that allows us to track how that physical quantity changes during those conditions. These apply to things like rocket launches, collisions between pucks on, an, on, a, on ice. So many, so many different situations, so many situations where we can use the conservation of momentum and energy to help us as a problem solving tool. Okay, and that's why we talk about it in a class like this. That's why we introduce these physical quantities because of their usefulness. Okay, now they're not immediately obvious what they are, what, or what are the units of momentum and energy. So we'll, we'll talk about what their units are and what, are they, you know, what actually defines them. But the big idea is that they're conserved. Okay, and then we'll finish up this lecture talking about machines, which are all about work in and work out, how much energy you put in, how much energy you get out, efficiency, also the, that condition or that consideration of energy in and energy out. And then finally, a qualitative discussion about the sources of energy. Where does energy come from? Well, it comes from the sun or from nuclear power, or, you know, so that's, that's an idea is that energy in the broad sense, not just these strict definitions, but it comes from places, okay? Okay, so starting with momentum, the first of our two conserved quantities, all right? So momentum is inertia in motion. We've talked about inertia, right? Really, we started so much of our discussion of physics and the physical sciences with that very definition, inertia. Okay, we know that inertia is mass. So that means momentum is mass in motion. Okay, well, it's defined as the product of mass and velocity. There's the mathematical definition of momentum. It is mass times velocity. Mass being measured in kilograms, velocity being measured in meters per second. Okay, and that gives us that the units of momentum are going to be the kilogram meter per second. Now, interestingly, that's also equivalent to the Newton second, because we know that the Newton has units of kilogram meters per second squared, and that comes from F equals MA. Please review lecture two if this doesn't sound familiar, okay? And we know that or the, or the units of the Newton, so then we can express the units of momentum as force times time. And that's interesting, because that means that mass times velocity is momentum, but momentum is also force times time. Let me write that down. Momentum is mass times velocity. That's a totally valid way to think about it. That's from this the very definition of what it is, like we have above. And it's also, as the units show us, and units can tell, tell a story like that, force times time. Okay? And that's important because that's going to help us understand why there's this other physical quantity known as impulse. Okay? So here's that definition, okay? Okay, so how does the product part, the not the force times time product part, but the mass times velocity expression for momentum, how does that, how does that play out? Well, you can have conditions where you have 
a large mass and a large velocity, which means a lot of momentum. So big things moving fast have a lot of momentum. On the other hand, if you have, um, or well, that's, that's if one or the other, or if they're both, you know, if it is a big thing moving fast, then that's even more momentum, all right? But then you could have, say, a low mass object that has low velocity, and that's gonna lower the momentum. So slow things, usually have very low momentum. Now, if they're slow and really massive, the momentum might be relatively higher, all right? But if they're slow and small, then there's very little momentum, okay? So that's just the idea there, but what, how the units work out, okay? So a moving object has what? Momentum, energy, speed, all of the above. What do you think? Well, we just talked about energy. I told you that we're gonna use energy in a conservation law sense. Well, turns out it's both, okay? So. All moving objects have momentum, energy, and speed. Now, do you know this one yet? The energy one, no. Are we talking about the momentum one? Yes, okay, we'll talk about energy in just a moment. So, when the speed of an object is doubled, its momentum does what? Think about the definition, the equation, form of momentum, okay? Maybe you have it, this is the reminder, momentum is m times v. Notice I'm, re I'm representing the letter for momentum, it's p. Okay, P for momentum. But getting back to the question, if the speed doubles, then the momentum also doubles. They're, they, those two quantities are directly proportional to each other. Momentum is directly proportional to speed. Momentum is also directly proportional to mass. Okay? Okay, so what about the idea that momentum is force times time. Well, that comes up with the idea of impulse because impulse really is change momentum. It's the same, it has the same units, obviously, but it's another way of thinking about momentum. So let's define it. What is impulse? Well, it's the product of force and time, okay? So in the equation form, impulse equals force times time. time. So impulse equals F times T, all right? And I'd write impulse as J. Okay, and then force, time, okay? So you see then that J is none other than P. See that? Impulse and momentum are the same thing by a different name, okay? So a great force for a long time is a large impulse. We often think of it as a push. You just gotta be careful if you're thinking of an impulse as a push because then you might think, oh, an impulse is a force, but it's clearly not. It's a force acting over a certain amount of time. It's force times time, not just force. Okay, and the same force for a short time would be a small impulse, right? Car, the car wouldn't speed up very much because it turns out that although I keep saying impulse is momentum and that's the way you should think of it, how does it, how do we, how do we directly relate? How would we practically relate impulse to momentum? Well, it turns out this idea of obviously speeding up the car, well, it's going then to relate to the change in velocity of the car, okay? If, if the person gives the car an impulse, right, then there's going to be a change in velocity. Well, that change in velocity means a change in momentum. So we see then that impulse is equal to a change in momentum, okay? Same units, really same quantity, but you, every time you have an impulse, your momentum changes. You can't have an impulse and have your momentum stay the same, okay? So when the force that produces an impulse acts for twice as much time, the impulse is what? Think about the proportionality here. How is force related to time? How is impulse related to time? Rather, how is impulse related to time? Okay, directly proportional. Impulse is directly proportional to time. Impulse is also directly proportional to force because of course, impulse is just force times time. Okay, all right. So the change in momentum of an object is equal to the impulse. See it? That's the key statement, all right? And that's the impulse applied to it, which is force multiplied by time interval, okay? So there we have it. Ft equals delta mv, or Ft equals delta p, because p equals mv. You can tell I'm being careful here with the variables. So you're used to writing these in equation form as well as seeing them represented as definitions and phrases, okay? So let's think about some causes, some practical cases of a change in momentum. All right, so we can have an increase in momentum. This could happen because a great force is applied for a long time, which creates a really big increase in momentum. 
So a golfer following through while teeing off, that's a big increase in momentum because that's a lot of force, all right? Now the time you might think is pretty short. We're talking fractions of a second that the golf club is in contact with the ball, but the force is large enough that, well, the contact time still works out to give a, lar a large change of momentum. The key there too is the golf ball is low mass because if you think of the equation, J equals delta MV, well, what's changing when you hit a golf ball? The mass isn't changing, only the velocity is. So then we can write that delta V, the change in velocity, is equal to the momentum, okay, which is the impulse, divided by mass. And small mass means, well, you're dividing by a very small number. When you divide by a small number, you get a big number. You get a large change in velocity, okay? Also, long barrels um, of long-range cannons, that long barrel means more contact time for the force on the ball. Because the chamber where the explosion is happening in a cannon, that's where the force is actually being applied due to the chemical reaction of the explosion. So longer chamber means greater contact distance, thus greater contact time between the explosion and the ball, thus greater change of momentum. Okay? So longer barrels mean faster bullets. Longer barrels mean faster cannonballs. So... A cannonball shot from a cannon with a long barrel will emerge with greater speed because the cannonball receives a greater, okay, what must it be based on what I was just saying? Impulse, right? Why? Because the time was increased, okay? And we'll talk about this kinetic energy in just a minute. That's a preview of things to come. Okay, so we can have decreases in momentum as well. All right, so over a longer time, the results in a smaller force. So if you want to have not such a big force when you're slowing something down, you want to slow that thing down slowly. And that makes sense because think about when you don't want to damage something, how do you slow it down? You slow it down slowly. That means you're increasing that time interval, which means you're going to be allowed to decrease the force, but still get the same change in momentum. Okay, so driving into a haystack, for example, is much easier on you in the car than driving into a brick wall because the haystack can crumple, crumple over time. The brick wall doesn't, okay? The brick wall causes an almost instantaneous stop, okay? Jumping into a safety net, which stretches versus solid ground, which, require, which creates an instant stop. So increasing your stopping time decreases your force, all right? So when a car is out of control, it is better to hit a haystack than a concrete wall, okay? Or those big sand embankments for runaway trucks. Common sense, all right? Duh. But there's, there's the physics reasons behind this. And it's great because this common sense can help us understand this term, which is new to many of us, momentum. All right? So the same impulse occurs either way, okay? Whether the you know time is large and the force is small, or the force is large and the time is small, right? Okay? So you get the same impulse both ways, which you have to, because it's the impulse that's going to bring you to rest, because we need V to be zero after each case, right? So really over here. We need the final velocity to be zero in both cases. And we had some initial velocity in both cases, right? Okay, so it had to be the same impulse. It's just the time changes, thus the force also changes, okay? All right. So another example, moving with a punch. So if you get hit, hit with something, you can increase the contact time by you know, withdrawing away from it. That's then there, therefore going to decrease the force on your face, okay? On the other hand, you could break something by decreasing that time, okay? So if you make the time incredibly short, then the only thing, the only thing that can increase is the force. So by having a very small time, represented here by writing it small like we were doing in the figure below, we can have a big force. And the smaller that time gets, imagine I shrink that time down so it's even smaller. Well, in that case, the force has to be even bigger because the product of the two in both cases always has to equal the same change in momentum because you're bringing the hand to rest. So how do you break the bricks? You have very, very short contact time, right? That's that abrupt stop or a very quick withdraw of the hand delivers much more force than just say, bringing the hand down slowly, okay? So pretty pretty neat idea there because it can really be pushed to the limits to cause these, these types of you know spectacles like breaking bricks, okay? So a fast moving car hitting a haystack or hitting a cement wall produces vastly different results. Both experience the same change in momentum, the same impulse, or both of them. Which was it? It's both, okay? Because they mean the same thing. 
impulse and change momentum are synonyms. Okay, which is a good takeaway at this point. When a dish falls, will the change momentum be less if it lands on a carpet than if it lands on a hard floor? I bet you know this one. It's the same, okay? The force would vary, but the momentum would not, okay? The change of momentum would not vary. Good, okay? So now let's talk about the way momentum is conserved. Because so far, I think it's just all been definitions. It's like, great, okay, momentum is this quantity. It's mass times velocity, it's force times time. But why do we care? We care because it's conserved. We care about momentum because it's conserved, and therefore we can track it through, through events, right? Through measurements, science, engineering. We can track that momentum change, and then that allows us to come up with results, okay? So in every case, the momentum of a system cannot change unless it is acted upon by an external force. To review the difference between an external force versus an internal force, look at the previous lecture, okay? But as long as there is an external force, momentum can change. But this statement can also be read as, if there's not an external force, then momentum can't change. And that's what we say down here. So a system will have the same momentum both before and after any interaction, okay? So like, you know, like something that, that happens without any external force, anything, like an explosion, for example. Because if something blows up and blows into a bunch of separate pieces, well, that all the force of that explosion is internal to the system, which is the thing that's blowing up. All right, so when the momentum does not change, we say it's conserved. So that means that the change in momentum equals zero if the external force on the system is zero. So there can be forces, but they must be all internal forces. Okay, all right. Again, review lecture two to see the difference between internal and external forces, which is near the end of that lecture. Okay. All right, so the law of conserv cons conservation of momentum. In the absence of an external force, here it, here it just is in, in a sentence form, the momentum of a system remains unchanged. So there it is, okay? Total momentum before equals total momentum after, every single time, okay? Okay, this is very useful for collisions, okay? So this idea of tracking conservation momentum, very good for tracking what happens after something blows up trying to find out where you expect the pieces to go, okay? So when objects collide in the absence of external forces, the net, net momentum before the collision equals the net momentum after the collision. You know what else this applies to really well? Pool, like playing um, pool on a pool table, because when those balls collide, you can exactly predict where they're gonna go based on conservation momentum, okay? So turns out there's two types of collisions. We classify them into two categories of elastic and inelastic. And this is going to tie in directly with talking about energy later in the lecture, the, considering these two types of collisions, because the difference between the two involves whether energy is conserved. Okay? So the difference relates to energy conservation. Okay? So let's describe each type, the elastic and inelastic collisions. So the elastic collision is defined as the collision whereupon objects collide without permanent deformation or generation of heat, okay? So that means that there is no loss of energy. Again, you know, getting ahead a little bit because we haven't really defined energy yet, but we will soon. So just hold that thought, no loss of energy. But that's implied, right? Because we're saying that it's not, it's not going anyway. There's, there's no, nothing's happening. It's a perfect collision in a sense. Very rigid balls would behave this way, okay? So, Let's look at the case here. So in the figure, figure A, we have a moving green ball hits a yellow ball initially at rest. See how the yellow ball starts at rest? Okay, this one's moving. When the green ball comes to rest, and then the yellow ball moves away with a velocity equal to the, the initial velocity of the ball. Okay, so they come together, they like trade places. See how the green one's left behind and the yellow one takes off? Well, that, that's, that absolutely must happen because momentum is conserved. And the two balls, must have the same mass. Otherwise, they would. this wouldn't happen. But you can imagine if the, the yellow ball is much more massive than the green ball, the green ball kind of ricochet off it, almost treating the yellow ball like a wall, and the yellow ball would just move a little bit. If it was, say, you know, 10 or 20 times more massive. But in this case, they both have the same mass m, okay? And then we can look in the other figures, um, basically B, 
C and D, or B and C, excuse me, and we can see other cases of momentum being, being conserved, okay? Now notice here, that in this case, they're both in motion and they just traded that motion. So the slower ball became the faster ball and vice versa, right? And again, here, they traded the motion of going in opposite directions. The green one, which was initially traveling to the right, becomes, becomes the one traveling to the left. No change in the values of velocity, okay? And that's all from conservation momentum. It's, my, it's what we might expect, but it's a nice, elegant result, okay? On the, on the other hand, inelastic collisions are where things do get tangled up, where there is a loss of energy, okay? Now you might be like, well, wait, energy can't you know, just disappear, right? Maybe, you know, maybe you've heard that idea before. When I mean loss of energy, I mean loss of energy from the system, okay? Because if heat is being generated, then that, that would be leaving the system, it would be external, okay? All right, so consider a check here. Freight car A is moving to an identical freight car B. So here we have the same mass, okay? Freight car B starts at rest. When they collide, both freight cars stick together. Okay, compared with the initial speed of freight car A, the speed of the coupled freight car would be what? The same, half, twice, or none of those? Which one is it? Half, okay? They'd be moving half as fast after they stuck together, okay? All right, after the collision, the mass of the moving freight cars has doubled. You can see that their speed is half the initial speed, okay? And what would that look like in equation form? because maybe you can't quite reason it out, or, to, or maybe that, that statement isn't convincing enough, right? Well, initially you had mv plus zero, because one was at rest, one was in motion, equals afterwards, what are you gonna have? Well, now you have one. You have both cars traveling as one, so two m, all right? And then some final velocity, which are called v final. Well, if I solve for the final velocity, I just divide both sides by two m, which would cancel out the m, and then I get that v final, equals the initial velocity divided by two, equals half the initial velocity, okay? Okay, so closely related to energy, and this is the point where we're bridging from talking about momentum to energy, but closely defined to energy is work, okay? Now, kind of like with momentum and impulse, we have two very closely related words, work and energy, same units, just different contexts, okay? Why start with work? Well, because work is a tie-in with force, and we learned about force in the previous lecture, in lecture two. Okay, so what is work? Work is defined as the product of force extended on an object and the distance the object moves. Okay, and it's, it's the only it's the only the distance that is in the same direction. So if there's some amount of distance that's in any other direction other than the direction of the force, then you would not you would not multiply by that part of the distance. So you have to sometimes find only the what's called the component of the distance that's in the same direction as the force, okay? We won't find those components in this class, but that's something you would do using trigonometry, okay? So it's interesting here, we're talking about a force multiplied by something, because we just did that. That was impulse, right? Impulse was force times time. So work is force times distance, okay? That's it, all right? So it's done only when the force succeeds in moving the body. So if there's, if there's no distance, then there's no work, okay? All right, and as an equation, it's work equals force times distance. So work, W, right, makes more sense than J for impulse, right? And W equals force times distance T. So see the similarity between these two equations for impulse and work, respectively? They're so similar. It's force multiplied by something, okay? All right, but different units, certainly, right? Obviously different units. Okay, so that is work. Okay, force multiplied by distance. And it kind of makes sense. Like you do work on something, you've moved it. Okay, so two things enter when work is done. There's always a force because you can't have work without a force and something moves. Okay, so work done on the barbell is the average force because the force is probably vary during the lift multiplied by the distance of the lift, the lift. Okay, so you lift at a certain distance. That's your D. How much force it took to do it would be your force. You multiply the two together, you got your work. Right? So let's consider, what if this thing, this um, dumbbell weighed 100 kilograms? So mass is 100 kilograms. That means its weight is going to be those 100 kilograms times gravitational acceleration. Right? And we talked about this in the previous lecture. We'll take it as 10 here, even though I say generally we don't. And that's going to give us 100 times 10, which is going to be 1,000. Okay? 
that's a thousand newtons of weight. Okay, well then that force times the distance, which we'll say is one meter, well, that will be the work. So then the work is going to be the thousand newtons times the one meter, which a thousand times one is just a thousand. Okay, and we usually represent it as newton meters. Okay, turns out there's another unit that we could use. We'll be talking about it in just a minute. You'll have to hold tight, I'll tell you. Okay, so if you push against the stationary wall for several minutes, you do no work on the wall at all. What do you think? Because could you tire yourself out doing this if you're pushing really hard? Yeah, right? But the wall doesn't move. You're not doing any work on the wall. All the work you'd be doing would be like internally on your blood vessels, your muscles, right? To constrict the blood vessels. That takes work, okay? But you'd be doing no work on the wall. Okay, so the quantity of work done is equal to the amount of force times the distance moved in the direction in which the force acts. So lifting, lifting the dumbbell, that was an example of doing work, pushing against a wall is not doing work, okay? So work falls into two categories, work done against another force and work done to change the speed of an object, okay? So work is done in lifting a barbell. How much work is done in lifting a twice as heavy barbell the same distance? So we doubled the weight. If we double the weight, weight is the force. It's directly proportional. Yep, it's directly proportional. The work is directly proportional to the force. Since the force is directly proportional to the mass, then that means the work to lift is directly proportional to mass. Good. Okay, you do work when pushing a cart. If you push the cart twice as far with the same constant force, then the work you do is less, twice, more than twice? Which is it? Or is it you just don't do any work? Well, the things are moving, so you're probably doing work. It's twice. Again, direct proportionality. Okay, so that's work. Turns out work is, has units that are the same as energy, I said it a minute ago, but energy is a bigger idea. Energy is a broader idea because energy doesn't just represent work. It represents the, something you can possess. So an object can possess energy, whereas we do work on an object. So energy defined as that which produces changes in matter. Effects of energy observed only when it's being transferred from one place to another, or it's being transferred from one form to another, okay? So for example, energy of motion, which we'll, we'll carefully define, it's one of our most common types of energy, becoming heat. That's what happens when you slam on the brakes. Take the energy of motion, say of, the moving, of a moving car, and then once that car comes to rest, where did all that energy go? It went to heat of the pavement, the rubber tires, okay? So both work and energy are measured in joules. There's that unit, okay? J for joules, okay? It's a unit, that's why I put in parentheses. Please distinguish between J for joules and J as a variable for impulse. Okay, so that's the definition of energy. We'll see a bit more about it when we talk about it being conserved and related to work. But first, let's do another definition, which is power, all right? Power is energy per time. So it's work and how fast it's done. Okay, so it's energy per time, energy per time. All right, that's power, power, P for power. Work done, which is the same as energy, over the time interval it took to do it. So the units are joules per second, you can see J per second, and we call that unit a particular name, we call it the watt, okay, that's W, the this is not the variable W, which is work. This is the unit W, which is the watt. So a job can be done slowly or quickly, okay, clearly. Both may require the same amount of work, but different amounts of power, okay? Because by changing the time, then you're changing the power, all right? If you do it quickly, that's high power. If you do it slowly, that's low power, okay? All right, so. Now let's talk about types of energy. So potential energy of a 10 Newton ball, right? There's its mass, it's gra you know, gravitational force acting on it, okay? And it's really not its mass, it's its weight, which is the gravitational force, okay? So, but they all, all balls have the same weight, all right? And we have work being done to lift them, okay? All right, and in each case, the ball gained the same amount of potential energy because we lifted it above the ground, and now has the potential to fall in the same amount in each case because the height is the same. 
There was no, no change in potential energy when we moved it side to side. So does it matter how or how far we move it side to side? It only matters what the vertical change of the position of the ball is because potential energy is related to the force of gravity because that's the, that's the force that's, that is, but has the potential to do work on the ball. Okay, so potential energy is defined as stored energy due to position, okay? All right, now there are, there are different types of potential energy. Here, we're implying that we're talking about gravitational potential energy, that's the most everyday type. There are other types of potential energy, including electro, electronic potential energy, elect, what's called electrostatic potential energy. All right, and is it a stored state? Energy has the potential for doing work. That's what potential energy means. Examples, draw and bow, that would be elastic potential energy. All right, the energy there is in the material. Stretch rubber bands, a raised ram of a pile driver, right? Because the gravity is about to drop it, okay? So the amount of gravitational potential energy possessed by an elevated object is equal to the work done against gravity and raising it, okay? So it's just equal to the work done by gravity. You get that? So potential energy is equal to the work done by gravity. The work done by gravity is the force times distance. Well, force times distance in this case would be weight times distance, which is change in height. And weight, of course, is mass times gravity. So then we get that the potential energy is equal to mg change in vertical position, delta y. Okay? So work done equals force required to move it upwards times the vertical distance, as I was just saying. Work equals, equals force times distance. Therefore, we get that potential energy is mgh because here h represents delta y. So potential energy is mass times gravitational acceleration times the height you lifted it to. Okay, so here, you know, if you start from the ground, your h would be your final height above the ground. Okay, so there's the equation. Gravitational potential energy examples. Water in an elevated reservoir. You've pumped the water up there, it has a bunch of potential energy now, right? And it has a potential energy of mgh. The elevated ram of pile driver, mgh, okay? Does a car hoisted for repairs in a service station have increased potential energy relative to the floor when you, when you lift it up? Absolutely, right? And you could then suddenly release that car, probably a bad idea, let it drop to the floor, and then you could change that gravitational potential energy into something else, okay? You could change it into something else because when you did that, when you release the car, its gravitational potential energy, well, it disappeared because gravity started doing work on that car. And as gravity would work on that car, the energy became kinetic energy. But let's talk about the work energy theorem, and then we'll talk about kinetic energy, okay? So it can apply to decreases in speed, so reducing the speed of an object or bringing it to a halt. So applying the brakes to a slow moving car, the work done on it is equal to the, the, work, uh, the work of friction is equal to its change in motion, bringing it to rest. Okay, so that means that this idea of kinetic energy is directly related to relating work to energy. Okay, it's defined as the energy of a moving body. So unlike potential energy, it's, it's an energy that you're using up right then and there. If you're in motion, you have kinetic energy. If you're at rest, you don't. You can be at rest and have potential energy because you've stored it, but kinetic energy, you have it or you don't. You're either moving or you're not. Okay, so kinetic energy, in equation form, and we're not gonna explain where this equation comes from, it comes nicely from calculus, but we don't discuss that here, is equal to half the mass times the speed squared. So it's an interesting equation. Kinetic energy is one half the mass times the speed squared. All right, so it's units. Well, one half doesn't have units. So obviously we look there, kilograms, and then the velocity is meters per second, but we're squaring that, all right? And that means that's gonna give us kilograms, meters squared, over seconds squared, well, that's the same as the Newton meter, which is just the joule. So clearly the units work out. It has units of joules, just like work does, just like potential energy. Because they all must have the same units in order to us to use equations to relate them, okay? And if they do have the same units, then we can use equations to relate them. Okay, but that this is the form of kinetic energy, one half mass times speed squared, all right? So must a car with momentum also have kinetic energy? Yeah, absolutely. If you have one, you have the other. If you have kinetic energy, you have momentum. If you have momentum, you have kinetic energy. Because one is, is the product of mass and velocity, the other is the product of mass and velocity squared and one half tacked off, right? So they're so similar. I right? consider how similar they are. P equals mv, momentum equals mv, kinetic energy equals one half 
mv squared. They're based on the same quantities, just arranged in a different way. Okay, but that what the fact they are arranged in a different way is not trivial, and it's great that we have both expressions could you know be able to express motion these two ways because then we can use conservation laws and solve mathematical problems. Okay, so back to the work energy theorem now that we've defined kinetic energy. When work is done on an object to change its kinetic energy, the amount of work done is equal to that change. All right, so the equation for the work energy theorem says that the net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Okay, so if, you, if your total work is zero, then your kinetic energy can't change and won't change. But if there is any, any amount of non-zero work being done on you, then that means your kinetic energy must be changing. And that's gonna to apply to situa situations where you're giving up potential energy, like being dropped, okay? So if there's no change in an object's energy, then no work is done on the object. This applies to potential energy, for a bar, barbell held stationary, no further, no further work is done on it, thus there's no change. It's just remaining at rest, which means this kinetic energy isn't changing, all right? It can also apply to a decrease, all right? So the more kinetic energy something has, the more work that was done to either slow it down or stop it, okay? So consider a problem that asks for the distance a fast-moving crate slides across the factory floor in coming to a stop. So you give it a push, it's moving along, how long will it coast or you know, slide until it stops? Okay, so what would be the most useful equation for solving this problem? It's a good one. Which of these equations do you think would be the most useful? Think about what you need to know, right? You need to know how far it slides. That's what we want to find out, how far it slides. Okay, so that means we need something that has distance in there. Which one has distance? Just the last one. So we relate the distance to the known friction force, to the known mass, and the known initial velocity. And that would, find, that would tell you how far it slid, all right? You would just simply have to solve for D by plugging in all the, other, all the other numbers, okay? So here's an example of the conservation of energy. I mean, a big deal that energy is conserved. Let's see that in practice. So energy transforms without net loss or net gain in the operation of a pile driver, right? So when we pull it up, it gains potential energy. Then we choose to, we do work to do that, by the way, right? This crank did work on the pile driver block in order to allow it to gain potential energy. Once all that work is done, it can hang there for a minute. Then we cut the string. That then allows gravity to do work. See, before it was the crank that was doing work. Now gravity is doing work. When gravity does work, it's going to transform that potential energy, the stored energy, into kinetic energy. Okay? And then that kinetic energy then can get transformed back into heat and some um, kinetic energy of the um, the pylon here of the stake, and that kinetic energy allows it to move into the ground because then it'll push the ground out of the way. So the work done in breaking a moving car to a stop is the force of tire friction times the stopping distance. If the initial speed of the car is doubled, the stopping distance is what? So how, how much further does it take to stop a faster car? No change in mass, just change in velocity. None of the above because it's actually four times. Twice the speed means four times the kinetic energy and four times the stopping distance. This is not a direct proportionality. And we should have noticed that if we were paying very close attention because the kinetic energy formula has a square in it. It's related to the square of velocity. So any questions that involve, involve velocity and energy I mean you have to be real careful to remember to either take a square root or square sides depending on what you're solving for, all right? And so when we see that kinetic energy is proportional to the square of velocity. If I double the velocity, well, 2 squared equals 4. Thus, I would be multiplying or quadrupling the kinetic energy, right? What would happen if I tripled the velocity? Solve that one on your own, okay? So that's the conservation of energy. Those are the big players of energy, which were potential and kinetic, okay? That's, and, you know, and there's there's also heat energy. We hinted at a bit. We'll talk about that later in the course. But really, the energy can be very simplified into just a few key forms. So the ones you only need to worry about now are potential energy and kinetic energy. And notice that we focused on gravitational potential energy, the, the stored energy of something being lifted above the ground. Okay? All right. So enough about that for now. We'll now wrap up this lecture with a few little topics, starting with machines. So what is the principle of machines? Well, the principle of the machine says that conservation of energy concept means that work in must be the equal to work out because what you put in, you have to get back out, okay? Now, it's true of a 
you know, kind of a perfect system where you're not losing any energy, right? That means that the input force times the input distance must equal the output force times the output distance. In equation form, that would be force times distance in equals force times distance out. So F in times X in equals F out, here I'm using X for distance, times X out. Okay, that's a great equation. Because that means that you can change the distance that the in force is, is pushed relative to how much distance the out force goes and get yourself a force change. You can have more force out than force in. But of course you can, because that's the idea behind, behind mechanical advantage. Okay? So the comparison of kinetic energy and momentum both depend on mass and velocity. As I said before, momentum depends on mass and velocity. Kinetic energy depends on mass and the square of its velocity. Momentum is a vector quantity. Kinetic energy is a scalar quantity. Momentum had direction, remember. Kinetic energy does not, okay? So the cons conservation is defined in everyday language as to save. It's the physics of rem things remaining unchanged. So the law of conservation of energy says that in the absence of external work, there's our condition, input or output, the energy of a system remains unchanged, okay? So if there, if there is external work, then energy can change, right? You can put energy into a system. But if there's not, if that, that system is isolated from the outside world, then we can track where the energy goes. The energy cannot be created or destroyed. So if the energy isn't leaving or entering the system, then it has to all still be there, okay? So consider the system of a bow and an arrow. In drawing the bow, we do work on the system and give it potential energy. When the bowstring is released, most of the potential energy is transferred to the arrow. Some would be lost as heat or vibrational sound energy. All right, so suppose the potential energy of a drawn bow is 50 joules, and that's the energy stored in the elastic bow, the string, and the kinetic energy of the shot arrow is 40 joules, then what happened? 10 joules go to warming, right? Those, that's the energy that was lost. Okay, now back to machines, All right? A machine multiplies the force, okay? It multiplies the force. So no machine can put out more energy than to put in. Okay, because by getting more force out, we're still keeping the energy the same. And that's the, that's an important thing because otherwise we'd be violating a lot of physics. It wouldn't work. Okay, but we can get more force out. We just have to keep the energy the same. Okay, we can't create energy, right? We can just transfer it. So machines are work input equals work output, which is force times distance in equals force times distance out. Okay, I wrote that equation before, right? So it's F in, X in equals F out, X out. All right, and a lever is a beautiful example of that because notice we can have a small force over a large distance on one side of the fulcrum, there's that fulcrum point, and then on the other side, we have a large force over a small distance, which means we can lift something heavy. We have to push a long ways, but we can lift something we otherwise would not be able to lift. And we only lifted a little, but at least we lifted it, okay? So, in an ideal pulley system, a woman lifts a 100 newton crate by pulling a rope downward with a force of 25 newtons. For every one meter length of rope she pulls downwards, the crate rises how far? Okay, a quarter as far, all right? Because that means, because of the mechanical advantage she's getting, she's losing a quarter of the distance, okay? All right, so it applies to pulleys too. So basically a pulley is like a circular lever, okay? So that's great for the principle of a machine, all right? But Machines aren't perfect, are they, right? We lose energy. We usually lose it to heat. And then that really falls under the category of efficiency. It's how perfect is your machine, okay? I, I imagine a simple lever like we talked about before would be pretty perfect because there's there's not a lot we're losing the heat, right? Maybe there's some air resistance, there's some, some heat at the fulcrum point, but not a lot, okay? But levers have big limitations. So actual kind of machines that can repeat themselves, we end up losing a lot of energy to heat. And we represent that with efficiency. It's how effective a device transforms or transfers useful energy, okay? The efficiency is the work done on the system divided by how much energy was used, okay? And multiplied by 100% to turn it into a percentage. Otherwise, it would just be a fraction, okay? So a machine with low efficiency means that a greater amount of energy is wasted as heat, okay? Some energy is always wasted, which we say it's dissipated. There's, it's, in, it's impossible to not have that be the case. We'll talk about that when we talk about the second law of thermodynamics, but not today, all right? And that means that no machine can ever be 100% efficient. So let's say, let's consider a certain machine that's 30% efficient. This means the machine will convert 30% of the energy input to useful work, 70% of the energy input will be wasted, 
Or does it mean that 70% of the energy input is converted to useful work with 30% of it being wasted? Or is it somehow both? No, it's the first case. So 30% of 30% efficiency means that that's how much was made into useful work, okay? So where do we get energy in the first place? If we're gonna convert it to useful things like you know, driving around cars or um, you know, having electricity in our, our, our wall outlets, where does it come from in the first place? Well, a very good source of energy is the sun, right? Sunlight evaporates water, water falls as rain, rain flows into rivers, and then we have big hydroelectric dams that have generators in them, and there we go. We turn the sun into that energy, indirectly, but we got, we got some of that energy. Or we can do it more directly with uh, solar energy, all right? Okay, all right. We can also get energy from inside of the Earth. That's a separate energy source, okay? That'd be internal to the Earth system, where you might consider the sunlight external to the Earth system. But the internal energy of inside the Earth is significant. There's a lot of radioactive decay, which means there's a lot of heat. And there's leftover heat from the creation of the planet itself. But most of the heat inside the planet is coming from continued radioactive decay. All right, and we can get that by having a, a drilling a situation like this. Um, again, probably mo getting the actual useful work by allowing water to boil. Right? That's going to be so often at the end of the day, we, if we want to get energy out of a system, we boil water. That, wa that As the water rises, it spins turbines. That spinning turbine motion, then we can turn into energy, particularly electric energy. We'll talk about how when we talk about the ideas of electromagnetic induction, but we're not there yet. Okay? So the power available in sunlight is about one kilowatt per square meter. All right? That's a huge amount of power of the entire planet. All right? And then all of, all of these are directly related to that. Notice that bio-based fuels are in there that you may think like growing fuels, but fossil fuels came from living organisms in the first place. So fossil fuels are a bio-based fuel, okay? All right, electricity, we can convert that energy into electricity, all right? So synthetic fuels can have stored energy then based on their, their molecular structure, all right? Hydrogen is not a source of energy, but it can generate energy by um, through very good combustion, all right? Uh, when, electric, when electric current passes through conducting water, bubbles of hydrogen form, on the wire, um, and then that's called electrolysis. That's, we can then use that hydrogen, all right? And here's a case of energy being converted directly into electrical energy using solar panels. And there's a good conclusion to the lecture, all right? Touched on many ideas we're gonna come back to, but think of this again as very fundamental to physical sciences, momentum and energy. Thank you so, for, so much for watching, I hope it was helpful.